Uh, my name is Lori Craner, and I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University in computer science and in engineering and public policy, and I direct our Scilab Security and Privacy Institute. Um, so the focus of my research is on the human side of security and privacy. So I look at things like how can we make passwords both more usable and secure? And how can we make um, privacy policies more usable? Um, we're looking at things like uh, the mobile app stores, the, the, the Google Play Store and iOS now have um, app privacy labels. And we're um, working on how we can make those more usable for people. Um, no, so we did research on privacy labels for mobile apps uh, about a decade ago and wrote papers about it. And um, we basically, I, I, I would like to, to claim we actually inspired um, uh, the companies to implement them. Uh, I've heard from people at Apple that they actually read our papers and that was part of their ins inspiration. Um, they did not run them by us though. And we have done some research on uh, the labels that have come out and found that they're really hard to use. People don't understand them. Developers don't understand them when they create them, so they might not be perfectly accurate. So now um, we're trying to find ways to improve them and hopefully can influence the companies to actually go and make them better. Oh yeah, that was a long time ago. That was, that, that project was, almost 20 years ago. Um, but uh, at the time, the um, movie companies were complaining a lot about people pirating movies um, on, um, on, on DVDs um, or uh, going into movie theaters with a uh, camcorder and like recording the movie and then you know, putting it on the internet. And um, we had seen a lot of evidence that uh, the pirated copies looked too good. Like it, if uh, it, you know, they, they couldn't have been made by somebody with a handheld camera like in the movie, right? Um, and so we went and downloaded a large number of pirated movies and just watched like the first five minutes and looked for evidence of whether it seemed like they were a really good copy or kind of a crappy copy um, and then looked at, well, how could the really good copy have gotten out? And the most likely thing is that either somebody from the music movie company just leaked it or um, they were sending out DVDs with screeners for critics. And it seemed like a lot of them were coming off of those. So we wrote a paper just basically saying, hey, the movie industry themselves is like leaking a lot and it's not just, you know, people going into theaters and, and stealing it. Um, well, so I started getting interested in privacy issues and um, I was very interested in public policy issues having to do with the internet and there, there's a range of them, but privacy is a big one. Um, and so I started working in privacy and then privacy is very much adjacent to security. And so I uh, started working with, with security experts um, and uh, then I um, uh, you know, in my work, I realized that, you know, the technical issues were interesting, but I was really interested in the human side of things. And like a lot of security and privacy failures were because of the people, not the technology. And so then I, I started getting into this usable privacy and security work. Yeah, yeah, we are doing some of that. Um, so for example, um, if you wanna make it easier for people to um, set up their privacy settings, you know, in their, um, on their mobile phone or their web browser or something, um, you know, there are like a lot of settings. Uh, you could use machine learning to learn people's settings and set it up for them. Um, or to develop profiles of different types of users. And, you know, you can ask people just a few questions about uh, their trade-offs for like privacy and convenience and things like that. And from that, like configure the rest of their settings for them. Uh, so in some of the work that we've done, we have used machine learning uh, to try to kind of predict what people want and, and help them out. Yeah. 
in my work, um, I'm rarely the one writing code these days. Uh, my students are writing the code, um, and half the time I, I don't even know what language they're using. They're using whatever they need to, to get it done, and and uh, I, I, I don't really care. Um, you know, I think they they uh, are using um, Python a lot. Um, probably more than Java right now, um, but uh, Java comes up too. Um, so actually, it's kind of funny. I didn't want to get into the CS field. Um, I really tried hard not to. Um, uh, when I was at Blair, I um, I, I you know took all the CS classes and I did well in them. Um, but I was often like the only girl in the class, and um, I didn't really like it. Um, and so you know I took the AP test. I did well, and I said I'm you know I'm going to go major in engineering, and I won't have to take any more computer science. Um, and then when I got to college, they didn't accept my AP scores and they made me take a placement test. And they said, congratulations, you tested out of two semesters of computer science. Uh, now, if you take two more, we'll give you credit for all four. Um, <laughs> that was not my plan, but you know, it's what I ended up doing. And then I could take one more class and get a minor in computer science. And I went with it um, and got a major in engineering. Um, and then I was working on my master's and my PhD in engineering and public policy. And along the way, um, I got an offer from the CS department to be their head TA and they were going to give me a fellowship, but I had to like actually get a degree in computer science. Um, and so uh, I got a second master's degree in computer science um, so that I could accept this fellowship. Um, and uh, but, you know, I still wasn't going to be a computer scientist. <laughs> Um, but then, you know, uh, seven years after I graduated, I found myself a computer science professor. So, you know, things happen. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, I focused on engineering and public policy and um, definitely the public policy side of things and the, you know, the problem solving you learn in engineering. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't done a, like a thermodynamics equation in like 30 years. Uh, I, I mean, at this point, I, I couldn't even do calculus anymore. Like I never do that. Right. Um, uh, but um, but definitely the kind of problem solving that you learn in engineering and, and the public policy aspect um, are things that that I, I deal with all the time in, in, in my career. Yeah, I mean, I, I love uh, the opportunity to be able to come up with ideas and then um, and then, you know, create things and and try them and um, and, uh, you know, build tools. And uh, so, yeah, and then I I'm also really a researcher and I, I really enjoy the, the whole research process. Um, so I'm very opportunistic, um, which might be how I ended up becoming a computer science professor accidentally. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, I see problems in the world that I that match my expertise and um, and I said, that's cool. I want to go do that. Um, so, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, we came up with the idea of the mobile app. Uh, privacy labels, uh, we put it out there, nothing happened. 10 years later, it appears, and we're looking at them and going, these kind of suck. Um, all right, new research project. Let's understand how they could be better. And we immediately started doing research on how to make them better. Um, that's kind of how a lot of things happen, how I, how I decide, you know, what, what the next research project should be. Um, there's a growing number of female uh, computer science uh, researchers and professors. Um, the number is still too small. Uh, we are still definitely in the minority, but, but there are more of us. Um, I think that, you know, over time, the community has become more accepting of women. Um, I, I wish I could say at this point there were no problems and nobody cares, you know, what your gender is and it was all perfect, um, but it's it's still not. Um, but I think there's a lot more awareness than there used to be um, 
that we need to be accepting and not just of women you know people from from different countries people people from um you know different races uh you know just all sorts of different minoritized groups um uh i think i think there there's a lot more acceptance now than than there was 20 30 years ago um but it's it's still not perfect um you know i i think we're we're at a stage where um yeah, you know, the the opportunities exist at least in paper. There, you know, there there are rules that say you can't discriminate. There are policies that say we mm. want to be inclusive and things like that. Um, but uh, we still have microaggressions. We still have you know individual people who make other people uncomfortable, mm. um, and uh, that that's a cultural thing and um i think you know there are definitely pockets of kind of bad culture and uh we all need to work towards changing that and um you know at my university i i often say you know like i'm i'm on board with most of the policies we have here um but but there i've heard people say things and um and i think the only way we stop that is that when we hear it we have to stand up to those people and say no no you can't say that like we're not going to have that discussion here um and you know and it's really hard to do but but i think that those are the kinds of changes uh that we need um there there's some other things as far as making it easier to manage work life balance and things like that um uh but i i'm seeing those changes you know starting to happen um you know i think there there's actually you know research you know people who um who do research on organizational um behaviors and things like that it has found that diverse groups are better groups they're more productive they're more creative um and so um uh you know if we if we want to do the best work you know we can do having diversity helps um i also think there are some areas of computer science where there's a real labor shortage right now and cybersecurity is one um so if we have a field that doesn't appeal to big chunks of the population then we're losing out on potential you know candidates for for these open positions we need to fill um I think, you know, a, a lot of people view computer science as you're just sitting in front of a computer and like writing code all day. Um, and some people love that. Some girls love that. Um, and, and that's great. Um, but even if you don't love that, which, and I'm one of the people who doesn't love that, <laughs> there are a lot of opportunities in computer science. And, um, and, you know, I think people should realize that it's not just this narrow field, but it's actually a very broad field and a lot of, a lot of things that you can do uh, with um, a computer science degree and computer science careers that go beyond um, just writing code all day. Um, so, for example, the, the human computer interaction field is, is very much about um, uh, interacting with people and observing behavior of people and trying to develop systems that work with people's needs. And I think that often appeals to a very different person than the type of person who just wants to write code all day. Music